हेलो गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स वी आर प्रोसीडिंग टू हंड्रेड एंड सेवेंथ क्लिनिकल मीट मिडास क्लिनिकल मीट ऑर्गेनाइज बाय मिडास मल्टी स्पेशलिटी हॉस्पिटल एंड मेडिकल फाउंडेशन हैव अ प्लेजर इन वेलकमिंग यू फॉर दिस मीट there are five cases and for this uh, we are fortunate to have professor philip abraham consultant gastroenterologist and heading the department of gastroenterology in hinduja hospital as a online chairperson dr rahul lokhande is a consultant surgeon practicing at amravati he is a uh, very much interested in gi surgical cases and uh, we have a local crowd uh, dr prashant bhandarkar senior another senior gastroenterologist will be joining raju wilkinson um, professor of surgery in lata mangeshkar hospital i welcome you all raju rachit is joining shortly and dr siddharth dhande young gastroenterologist who is started recently so i'll request uh, raju and siddhar to start the proceeding and uh, uh, must tell you that mmc has approved one credit point for this uh, clinical meeting so those who have joined probably can put their um, mmc uh, the registration number maharashtra medical council registration number and uh, send us the you know uh, details so that uh, we will sort of um, do the formalities to get you one credit point and we'll make it possible for every time when you have a clinical meeting we'll try and get one uh, credit point so that uh, you can complete the credit points desired with this brief introduction uh, i'll ask the chairpersons to please join dr prashant bhandarkar informs me that he will be little late so you we can start the proceeding and so also the dr achit agrawal thank you well i think with no further ado we should begin the proceedings with the uh, the first case is of strictures sigmoid lesion akshay kulkarni Uh, good evening one and all uh, esteemed uh, senior colleagues present uh, physically as well as online <clears throat> so i'm here to present uh, an interesting case uh, uh, of what appeared to be a colonic growth in an elderly woman a 65 year old female uh, hypertensive she was on clonidipine uh, she had acute onset of loose stools uh, a few months ago Uh, had lower abdominal pain and fever and presented uh, somewhere else uh, was uh, evaluated after stabilization uh, uh, her evaluation revealed only mild and deficiency anemia and leukocytosis she was treated with antibiotics with the suspicion of uh, an infective uh, diarrhea and she improved uh, but it was only temporary uh, the stool frequency again came back recurrent loose stools and lower abdominal pain persisted uh, there was no bleeding urgency or incontinence so uh, no rectal symptoms to uh, to summarize uh she started modifying her diet because she was continuously having these loose stools and she started losing weight because of that uh, and mild anemia persisted in her uh, subsequent investigations in march 2022 uh, about 6 months ago she underwent her first colonoscopy because of uh, this diarrhea it was not responding and uh, 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 elsewhere this colonoscopy found a rectosigmoid growth it was circumferential but non obstructive the uh, uh, the uh, scope could pass beyond uh, the growth we don't have uh, pictures of this colonoscopy but uh, it was uh, completed till uh, cecum and terminal ileum biopsies were taken from this growth and it only revealed some non specific inflammation there is no mucin depletion granuloma or dysplasia no malignancy 
there was no submucosal invasion and uh, <clears throat> there was maintained crypt architecture so uh, uh, the biopsies were uh, really non specific uh, the uh, growth uh, continued to cause diarrhea there was no obstruction uh, clinically as well as endoscopically biopsies were non specific uh, but uh, the patient had no relief despite some medications uh, that were given to her and antibiotics a repeat colonoscopy was planned at another center and uh, uh, the same growth there was no increasing size or uh, luminal obstruction was not present and remaining colon was again normal biopsies this time revealed uh, some few dysplastic glands with uh, inflammation uh, and uh, still uh, no uh, clear cut malignancy or invasion was to be seen uh, so at this point of time i would like to uh, invite the comments from the house uh, about the possibilities where a colonic growth and a recent onset diarrhea in an elderly female uh, malignancy is always high on the cards but biopsies are negative twice so um, other than malignancy if anybody could uh, venture a diagnosis uh, her stool examination was done only in the first episode it showed a, a plenty of uh, pus cells but and she had fever at that time but the fever never recurred and infective diarrhea was uh, almost unlikely because she never responded to antibiotics Uh, uh, sir, uh, tuberculosis uh, is an interesting uh, possibility, but uh, uh, I should mention that uh, colonic tuberculosis is exceedingly rare among all the GI tuberculosis cases that we get in India. Uh, only about 3% of all GI tuberculosis will be having colonic tuberculosis and rectal tuberculosis or rectosigmoid distal uh, uh, colonic tuberculosis is again even exceedingly uh, very rare to find. So. tuberculosis is not one of the diagnosis especially with recent onset diarrhea only a few weeks to start with and then the growth uh, tuberculosis is something one would not think of <clears throat> yeah so uh, uh, i agree with you uh, a strictures lesion not frankly a stricture the scope was always able to pass in both the bio, both the colonoscopies 3 months apart a growth would increase in size and uh, cause an obstruction uh, there was a growth uh, both the uh, yeah so the colonoscopic pictures of the previous colonoscopies done elsewhere are not available i'm going to show you the colonoscopy that we did at medas next so uh, okay we'll go next uh, so currently we are at a loss uh for a diagnosis or for a differential so she was admitted and evaluated uh, still we had this mild iron deficiency anemia and the other tests were normal there were no inflammatory markers which were raised uh so uh we again planned a colonoscopy and biopsy and uh, can we ask the audience what they have in mind what further tests they would want two colonoscopies and negative biopsy apart from the picture of the colonoscopy any cross sectional imaging was performed before this uh, cross sectional no, imaging no, no. cross sectional imaging was not performed uh, in the last 6 months that she had a course and uh, what about what earlier about there was no cross sectional imaging only uh, only a uh, sonography uh, an ultrasound uh, showed a lower abdominal or a pelvic uh, growth which was corresponding to the location of the rectus oblique would the uh, endoscopic ultrasound be useful uh, uh, sir we are suspecting malignancy here as the first differential and uh, uh, they generally arise from the mucosa so an endoscopic ultrasound would be uh, useful to see the depth of the invasion of this malignancy and to stage the malignancy if it is still uh, not breaching the serosa but uh, 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 for a clear cut epithelial growth uh, an endoscopic ultrasound uh, will not uh, be useful in differentiating it from a malignancy or uh, establishing a diagnosis of another uh, lesion yeah uh, so uh, that's an interesting question and uh, we were kind of waiting for that cea carcinoma embryonic antigen which is a marker for colonic malignancies was not done in the previous evaluation uh, also uh, cea is not used or doesn't have much role in the diagnosis of a colonic malignancy it is rather used for screening and monitoring of a recurrence uh, in an operated colonic malignancy or an or a malignancy which is undergoing chemo radiation and has responded so cea is not used for the diagnosis of malignancy because uh, most of the times the biopsy is almost 100% specific and sensitive 
apart from knowing about the cross sectional imaging yeah, uh, do, do not interestingly in this patient uh, until she came to us do we know anything about whether there was a mucosal breach in her uh so uh, so muco uh, yes so here is the colonoscopy that we performed at midas in july uh this is the first colonoscopy that we did so at 30 centimeters from the anal verge uh, we can see a polypoid lesion we have applied uh, narrowband imaging to show that there is at least uh, two or three abnormal areas uh, showing uh, an abnormal surface pattern uh, which uh, suggested that it could be sinister and we can take so we now turn it on to standard endoscopy and biopsies are being taken from this lesion uh, we took extensive biopsies from all the areas possible i should note here that uh, our scope could not go beyond this fold because the uh, the growth or the or the lesion was obstructing the passage of the scope further so we could not complete the colonoscopy to a full length so, uh, so this is the biopsy of the lesion uh, uh, the surface biopsies and uh, i would invite uh, dr ravi sir to add some comments on this Showed a polypoid lesion, but then again it was not malignant. It was inflammatory, ulcerative. With again lymphoplasmocytic and absolutely no dysplasia. So we called it that likely to be a surface of a polypoid lesion or a polyp with inflammation. No evidence of malignancy in this section. Ah, uh, uh, but uh, no adenoma. Am I right? No, sir? no adenoma. No adenoma. No adenoma. No adenoma. So this is not an adenoma, or not an abnormal proliferation of the colonic glands. It showed just showed a normal colonic epithelium. with some inflammation but no dysplasia again and definitely no uh, invasion of the muscular mucosa so uh, with this th this is the third biopsy now that we have uh, it's again not showing malignancy and showing normal colonic mucosa so any differentials crohn's disease will have a, a, a transmural inflammation or the uh, level of inflammation uh, dr philip abraham sir is the supreme authority on this and uh, he can correct me if i'm wrong uh, he uh, uh, the inflammation will uh, uh, actually cross over to all the layers of the colon and uh, will be much more severe plus there will be cryptitis and cryptabscesses and branching uh, a general distortion of the normal colonic architecture whereas on the right side of this image you can see that the colonic architecture including the mucus glands are normal so crohn's uh, is less likely i think we should make a point here that this is a mass lesion and it's a localized one what we can see as a mucosa beyond that is obviously intact i have two questions here in the chat box being asked one asking whether this is this could be microscopic colitis this question was of course asked before the biopsy and the second asking whether this could be endometriosis do we have a response to these two uh these are two questions that are put up in the chat box so can we clarify microscopic colitis would mean first that there is no mass lesion and secondly microscopic means that endoscopically the system should look normal so although we now have the clear picture here the first two colonoscopies also reported that there were mass lesions so you don't talk about microscopic colitis the moment you can see macroscopic changes macroscopic changes number 1 Number two about endometriosis. She is sixty-five, so sixty-five is not the age that you would get endometriosis in. So these two points, I thought I'll clarify because there were questions put up in the chat box. Sorry, we disturbed. Go ahead, please. There was no evidence of uh, neither Crohn's, like no 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 crib changes and no submucosal edema, no granulomas, <laughs> as well as uh, microscopic colitis is always a histological diagnosis, and it was not there. because it was almost normal mucosa with mild inflammation there was no collagen band there was no lymphocytic colitis so for all practical purpose i was almost seeing near normal colonic mucosa with some degree of polypoid type lesion with inflammation but no no adenoma and no malignancy sometimes hello hello can you thoda increase 
Sometimes when you have mass lesion like this and the biopsy is negative, lymphoma is also one of the possibilities and the lymphoma can give rise to only mononuclear cell infiltration. So I means that can be when you have a polypoid lesion with 2233 two, biopsy is negative, I think one has to think in terms of uh, uh, lymphoma as one of the differential diagnoses. So, in the absence of uh, our advanced age, in the absence of these symptoms, progressive symptoms, uh, no fever, no weight loss, she is, she did lose a marginal amount of weight, but that was because of diet modification mostly. Uh, and looking at the colonic lesion, looking at the colonic lesion, one would in in consultation with probably the patient's history, uh, it may not be that uh, relevant. Yes. Now. Can you show the video again now, just for everyone to see the colonoscopy video? Can we just go back? So if you see, is this the last colon video? Is this the, this is the first one? First. Okay, so we have yet to reach there. Hmm. There's another. Okay, fine. Let's continue the presentation because I think one thing to be noted <clears> here <throat> is the, uh, you see the, the pattern, the mucosa, it's essentially pronounced. So it is not an adenomatous type appearance on those parts, if you see on the left. Yes. So uh, we can go further down in the presentation, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, so uh, with uh, only malignancy high on the cards uh, since her advanced age and recent onset symptoms, uh, but not getting, not clinching the diagnosis in even biopsies or in the third biopsy, uh, we, uh, uh, we, uh, thought of it this as a polyp. We thought we would resect it with a submucosal dissection and uh, obtain biopsies from all parts of the uh, uh, the lesion and look for invasion or look for uh, any evidence of uh, neoplasia. Uh, we would we planned uh, to do uh, cross-sectional imaging uh, before uh, before proceeding. Uh, for a submucosal dissection. Her lungs uh, are clear. There are no metastasis over there. So is her liver absolutely clean. There are no lymph nodes. Uh, the growth is, uh, the growth will be visible now as you see on the right side of the screen, the descending colon continues uh, and then uh, loops forward into, into a sigmoid colon somewhere here. And uh, I, would, I would rather back it off and this is the growth so one can see a thickening obstructing the lumen uh, but still allowing some passage of the contrast here which is visible lower down this is uh, 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 an asymmetrical thickening in the sigmoid almost uh, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters in length and it's uh, about 30 centimeters from the anal verge so this thickening continues but there is contrast in the rectum so, and essentially non-obstructive growth. After six months of, of the detection for the first time, it has still not obstructed the lumen. Uh, Left-sided lesions generally obstruct the lumen faster. So, uh, no metastasis, no spread, no, no lymph nodes. Uh, and uh, we, still, uh, we are still stuck on malignancy. So, in, any other differential after this CT, please. Okay. So... Uh, uh, so we went ahead with the tentative plan of ESD and did a did an evaluating colonoscopy. And to our surprise, we found that this polypoid lesion had now somehow uh, receded a bit, and uh, the lesion was still visible. But there was a new development or a new finding that we appreciated, and there was this large outpouching of the colonic lumen. The lumen can be seen differently here. Let me pause it. So that's the uh, lumen of the large colonic diverticulum. And this is the normal colonic lumen. I hope everybody can see my cursor. This is the normal colonic lumen. And this was a large colonic diverticulum. And there were a couple of big diverticula uh, in this area, which were inflamed and were giving an appearance of a large mass uh, that will play it again. So there was one diverticulum here and a second one lower down. And these were visible as small air pockets in the cross-sectional imaging that we did previously. This is another diverticulum at two o'clock. 
it is a large one and uh, uh, yeah the scope almost went into that diverticulum so <clears throat> was a totally benign lesion a diverticulosis which got complicated and she presented with diarrhea because of diverticulosis and diverticulitis i'm sorry so she underwent instead of uh, the submucosal dissection she underwent an open sigmoidectomy and anastomosis um, and uh, the surgical so findings there was no ma though no mass lesion palpable on uh, examination during surgery so i didn't go for an oncologic resection just the plain sigmoidectomy which is done for a sigmoiditis uh, the sigmoid diverticulitis patient that's what was done and uh, anastomosis was done there was no need of stoma because uh, bowel was okay and uh, we had a good preparation before surgery no fistula no fistula uh, there was no fistula it was so, a simple state for our sigmoid so uh, this was a surprising presentation of colonic diverticulosis uh, complicated with diverticulitis presenting as diarrhea and a mass uh, so diverticulosis presenting as a mass uh, i when i try to look up the literature uh, i found out this study from uh, kerala in indian journal of gastroenterology uh, they had uh, 299 diverticulosis over the 3 years uh, that they performed uh, 3000 colonoscopies 40% of them are uh, right sided and 80% were detected when the colonoscopy was done for some other reasons like diarrhea or constipation and the age group of these patients diagnosed with diverticulosis was 50 to 70 less than 10% were presenting with acute complications such as acute abdominal pain diarrhea uh, or uh, uh, or uh, tear bleed but uh, they have not mentioned uh, a patient, any patient presenting with a colonic mass uh which uh, seems like a malignancy uh less than 10% will present with complications most of the, them will be asymptomatic and even uh, a lesser proportion will require an urgent surgery for these complications and uh, there are few other studies uh, from uh, from uh, uh, our indian lit literature but they are mostly based on uh, retrospective evaluations of uh, barium uh, animals and uh, finding diverticula in them one of them uh, being from uh dr mahesh goenka from pj chandigarh uh, they also evaluated uh, i think 700 uh, barium animals and found only 7% of them had diverticula barium is not a great investigation compared to an endoscopy uh, to look for diverticula so i guess uh, that incidence is kind of an understatement but yeah uh, sorry so i i think uh, i I've been in the west so i was used to seeing diverticulosis right left and center center so we're very familiar with this entity of course less in india but uh, basically you see there are uh, inflammation with diverticulosis it is either diverticulitis or you would be you call it segmental colitis with associated diverticulosis which is called scad it is an entity which behaves similar to an inflammatory bowel disease causing a uh, inflammation and stricturing now in this particular case the diverticula are also inflamed so i'm not i'll have to see if the scad means a normal diverticula with the segmental colon being affected or this is just a routine diverticulitis and and i, I know i was the one who was supposed to do the esd but I, I I really took the patient as let me just see what's going on. It was not like yeah I'm going to go ahead with ESD because you look at the CT there is thickening and structural um, and luminal narrowing. Now whenever you're looking at any mass lesion also and you know if there's luminal narrowing, this is not ESD able. Let me just put it because the patient it's already reached the uh, muscular is propria in those instances, so you will not be able to remove it effectively. the idea was to take a look again take a look and see you know get an understanding of what's going on uh, so that there was sort of the rationale behind this yes i was also going to talk about the same entity diverticular associated colitis and in fact we had presented presents like a segmental colitis similar to that of crohn's disease and the, or ulcerative colitis so but then uh, the inflammation uh, the uh, biopsy has not revealed any of the inflammation no cryptitis so there was no evidence of colitis but the major i mean the major surprise in this case is morphological appearance of a polypoidal lesion 
seen by three different colonoscopists at three different times to the extent that uh, the i must tell you that we had a ai for demonstration and the ai also suggested that this could be malignant so i mean the morphological appearance was so much appealing as malignant but turned out to be diverticulum associated but then the biopsy was taken from polypoidal mass it was taken from the polypoidal mass each time yeah i, th I think so. yeah i think it was a normal mucosa with a lot of edema that's why it had a very pronounced appearance on the villi you know it, it, this this was not distorted like an adenoma you know should be a part of initial evaluation because luminal yeah. evaluation is okay but wall uh, colonic wall pathologies they will be detected on ct uh i personally feel that uh, there could be prolapse of the mucosa in between as a result of which it was possibly giving a pseudo polyp type of appearance <laughs> that that is my thinking which would explain because once the specimen is done that is not and once the inflation proper is done that uh, polypoidal during the last colonoscopy that uh, has disappeared so it was a pseudo polyp like appearance secondary to diverticuli so that learning point which sir said uh, a cross sectional imaging way before in this evaluation and other thing which we could have done was a rectal contrast so whenever we have a sigmoid or a descending colonic mass lesion we should always give a rectal contrast probably a rectal contrast could have picked up diverticula in this patient even in the ct scan itself and that could have given us the diagnosis that it is diverticula with which we are dealing with Yeah, so one more thing to learn in this yes uh, always ask for a rectal contrast to our cities when uh, yeah, when yeah. we are doing uh, yeah no but then we could have got something ki why probably we are dealing with a diverticula associated or diverticulitis related uh, thickening because three biopsies are negative yeah. and three colonoscopies could not reveal the diverticula yeah so yes. you are saying that the colonoscopy is better than Medium, medium, yeah, uh, the normally, normally diverticulitis or even diverticulosis will present as an outpouching of the mucosa, and it's best visible from the wall. And uh, outpouchings of the mucosa, just because of contractions or segmental contractions, can be uh, misinterpreted as diverticula in a barium enema. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. As my apologies for being late. Late uh, special regards to my mentor, Dr. Philip Abraham. Sir Prashant here. Hi, Prashant. So good to hear from you. Good to see you on screen. So we meeting virtually. Okay. Last comment, sir. Uh, before. I'm sorry. We, any last comment from you before we move on? Yes, just two or three comments, which may or may not be directly related to this case. One is, this is for everyone to just hear about it. our pathologists always tell us and in fact literature always say that when you have a stricture or a stricturing lesion in the colon always think of it as neoplastic unless proved otherwise unlike in the small lesion small intestine you don't get non neoplastic strictures commonly in the colon number 1 number 2 our rate our pathologists always tell us that when we describe a mass almost always it's a neoplasm so it's very rare for us to talk about an adenoma or a polyp or an adenocea which on histology proves to be a non neoplastic lesion now these are just two comments made by our pathologists now in this case what surprises me is only the fact that such a huge diverticulum occurred in isolation so there's a third entity that i wanted to mention and that is the winsock diverticulum where you have an inverted diverticulum a huge diverticulum that now prolapses into the lumen giving the appearance of a mass lesion and particularly when the mucosal biopsy is negative three times over and the histology also is so clear in the intact mucosa we should always think of something happening beyond the mucosa so cross sectional imaging yes but in retrospect i was wondering whether this is a winsock diverticulum that means an inverted diverticulum now prolapsing into the lumen which went back to its original phase after time of course all of us would consider this as neoplastic unless proved otherwise so these were just some of the inputs i thought i could give from our side okay shall we move on to the next case 
thank you, sir. We move on to the next case. Mysterious postpartum ascites. Two cases by Dr. Shrikan Mukhevar. Okay. Thank you, chairpersons. Uh, couple of months back, we have encountered back to back two cases uh, who presented with ascites and had uh, recently delivered. So the first case was a multi-para G2, uneventful pregnancy. There was no history of preeclampsia, no albuminuria, hypertension. She had lower segment caesarean section of 7th of June. The post-operative period was associated with paralytic ileus, which was treated conservatively. And within five days, she was discharged home. But after going home, she presented with progressive abdominal distension to be admitted again. And her investigations revealed mild anemia. The liver functions were normal, but the albumin was low, 2.4 and the globulin was 4.5. Uh, she had done CT outside, which revealed that she had ascites, bilateral pleural effusion. There was no mental thickening. Uterus and adenexa were normal. Hepatic veins were patent, and the pancreas was normal, and there was no lymphadenopathy. So the ascitic fluid examination showed a fluid protein. These are all outside reports. And uh, the albumin was 2.4 with the 800 lymphocytes with 80%, 800 cells, 80% lymphocytes. Cytology was negative, but she didn't have any fever. The triglycerides were normal and there was no growth on culture. So she, when she was referred to her, she was in a postpartum state, had persistent ascites, anorexia, but no fever. Clinical examination was unremarkable, no lymphadenopathy, and no stigma of CLD, chronic liver disease. Investigations with us, apart from anemia, all the thyroid function, 24 hours urine protein were not significant. Tissue TTG, IgA was done because she had low albumin. Uh, the fluid examination revealed uh, albumin, fluid albumin of 1.5. So the SAG was 0.9 and the cells were 300. TG, because the fluid was a uh, turbid, uh, possibility of chylus ascites was thought of and the triglyceride were done, which were normal. The cytology was negative. The culture was negative. The ADA was uh, nor normal. Ultrasound examination with us, ascites only. Now, what are the complications, uh, possibilities, which we thought at this stage? Because the patient had LSCS followed by ascites, so we thought of some LSCS related complication responsible for ascites. The second possibility is most of these patients, they may have underlying CLD, which gets manifested when they have some insult. Normally, when you have pregnancy with a procoagulant state, so Bardichieri syndrome can present with hepatic venous thrombosis. She had a low albumin caesarean section. So hypoalbuminemia with sepsis, tuberculosis, and of course, malignancy because she had a low sac. So the first investigation which we did was a fibro scan, which revealed a normal F2 fibrosis, but no cirrhosis. The echo was done. Whenever we have the uh, cardiac problem, it could be postpartum cardiomyopathy, so the 2D echo was normal. Endoscopy was done. 
biopsies were obtained from the second part of duodenum which were normal cytology again with us the cytology culture cell block and c um, were non contributory so at this stage the patient had persistent ascites we ruled out the liver disease there was no evidence of bacheri syndrome there was no history of fever though it was exudate the lymphocytes were 300 with 20% lymphocytes with us so that was not significant ada was negative no history of fever so what next well it uh, accumulated over a period of i think 1 to 2 weeks when she i think we removed about 500 to 1 liter of fluid gross ascites uh excuse sorry lymphatic damage yeah that's a good suggestion lymphatic damage and sinusoidal obstruction should be considered yeah anything else anybody wants any, to raise any tumor markers we done tumor markers we haven't done basically because uh, you know she was a young female and uh, postpartum and uh, cytology reports three times being negative so we didn't do any tumor markers ct has been done and uh, basically we rule out cardiac cause hepatic cause there was no evidence of myxedema no albuminuria uh, no evidence of bacheri syndrome so literally almost we done everything <laughs> yeah so what we did was to go ahead with diagnostic laparoscopy in fact before proceeding i would say that the uh the place where this lady was admitted they had almost decided to start anti tb on her because exudate and lymphocytes so i last dr bang uh, about the laparoscopy so it was a uh, uh, postpartum case uh, ascites was actually uh, large volume paracentesis was done so we entered the abdomen with the umbilical cord and what we found were so these many flakes were there and uh, there was ascites which we aspirated first and uh, we could see this is the uterus so just above the uterus these are the pus flakes or these white flakes which we are seeing there so i didn't disturb that i didn't uh, take down the uterus to see whether there is any problem with the scar what i did was just took a peritoneal biopsies and i took out these flakes to see if there is any uh, 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 is it an infected flake which is causing uh, these trouble to take uh, culture of that so we took a large uh, peritoneal uh, flap and uh, took out the biopsy of that and uh, just aspirated all the ascites which was there in the abdomen gave good saline wash and then kept a drain in this patient uh, uh, the ascites actually was bit turbid probably because of uh, two or three times aspiration or four times aspiration being done there was probably some secondary infection in that that's why it was turbid so that is the finding which we had rest all organs were normal small bowel and uh, liver was also normal so we did a biopsy which uh, uh did not uh, reveal anything you want to say something ravi it only showed some adipose tissue fragments some inflammatory cells and some macrophages but then there was nothing specific i could uh, decide what it is in fact retrospectively we did discuss so many things but uh, at the time of histopathology i just called it non specific so we were really stuck so this patient had a follow up had a persistent drain which uh, continued over a period of uh, one uh, literally 20 days right from 175 ml to 75 ml gradually the drain reduced and drain removed after 3 weeks fortunately the patient is asymptomatic now so going by the 
differential diagnosis what could be the cause in a patient who is postpartum ascites when i reviewed the literature the postpartum ascites is one of the rare complications the main causes are two either a pregnancy related complication or an underlying disease so bercheri syndrome uh, pregnancy uh, uh, pregnancy or the postpartum forms about 7% to 47% of etiology of bercheri syndrome so that's uh, quite common and there is a paper from nor by dr jb dilavri which has said that the incidence is 47% the cause is supposed to be the hypercoagulable state associated protein s deficiency or myeloproliferative disorder our patient did not have there are many case reports of pre eclampsia related ascites and massive ascites leading to the um hormonal changes vasoconstriction and so on the eosinophilic ascites was also described as one of the few rare but the our patient did not have uh, eosinophils in the biopsy as well as the peripheral eosinophilia uh, there are cases of chylus ascites being reported following delivery and the Uh, the reason is pelvic congestion secondary to hormonal changes overflow vasodilatation and rupture of uh, lymphatic vessels leading to chylus ascites as suggested by abhiram but the patient our patient the triglyceride content were normal now as we said vod small vessel uh, obstruction Uh, as you get in bercheri you get a large vessel so whether it is vod the condition has been described with bush tea pyrolizaline alkaloids and now with the uh, hematopoietic transplants but uh, the in not in pregnancy we haven't uh, there are no case reports of vod in pregnancy rupture of intraperitoneal urinary bladder leading to ex uh, the urine ex uh, this thing leakage of the urine causing presentation of ascites are also described in the literature but we have done the leprotomy and the bladder and uterus and everything was examined carefully and there was no evidence now this new entity which i was also not aware vernix caseosa peritonitis vernix caseosa is a thick white paste which is present on the fetal skin in the third trimester there were only 19 cases reported in the literature till 2010 that what happens is a spillage of amniotic fluid and vernix caseosa in the peritoneal cavity that leads to an inflammatory reaction we don't know whether this is the cause of our patient but when talking to the gynecologist to had conducted the lower segment cesarean section she said that uh, this one is the possibility because uh, we have asked her did you put any antiseptics what gloves did you use did you use sidex other things because all these can give rise to inflammatory reaction and ascites so di uh, diagnosis uh, you should sell squamous cells in these which are not seen in our patient so we don't know some the prognosis wise some uh, show rapid resolution and some show protracted course our patient as far as uh, discussing all these causes i feel that she had severe hypoproteinemia for which we couldn't find any cause there was no history of vomiting diarrhea renal disease but she was hypoalbuminemic 2.4 so hypoproteinemia with fluid collection with sepsis was one cause because sepsis was evident the second possibility is definitely amniotic fluid or vernix caseosa peritonitis i have a second case so should we discuss after the second case so this is a second 
patient who is 25 year female full term gravida lsds lscs 25th of may she had a post operative subacute intestinal obstruction and the uh, underwent bilateral dj stenting laparoscopy outside there were adhesion clump bowel loops lavage was done peritoneal biopsy was done we showed non specific inflammation within 2 months she had abdominal pain abdominal distension the ct scan showed that she had dilated bowel loops with transition shown in the distal jejunum diffuse peritoneal thickening possibility raised was small bowel obstruction question mark cox so with this ct scan report and earlier laparoscopy as well as dj stenting done outside she had presented to us with eight days history of abdominal pain constipation vomiting suggestive of obstruction there was a weight loss of 5 kg no fever clinical examination was that there was a ill defined palpable bowel loops we can say like a cocoon her abdomen was like a cocoon so we kept the possibility of sclerosing peritonitis the hemoglobin was mildly elevated counts were elevated mildly low hemoglobin the counts were elevated albumin was low rest alkaline phosphatase 213 this was the first x ray done with us we showed the fluid levels if you see carefully the there was a contrast uh, which can be which is visible because of the ct scan done earlier and the x ray chest to find out about tuberculosis did not reveal any lesion now the issue was she already had two one laparoscopy biopsy so in fact we had a discussion in house that uh, we should start anti tb in this patient and don't touch the patient because whenever you have um omental thickening and the cocoon like thing putting in a laparoscope can lead to damage of the intestine so dr bang was not very keen on putting the laparoscope but i insisted that we should get a diagnosis so so what is the differential diagnosis was a dilemma whether it is tuberculosis adhesion secondary to earlier uh, surgery which underwent two months back or there was there any missed lesion or was it related to lower segment cesarean section so yogesh so that sir said i was not very keen so i didn't even take any intra photos i just uh, so if you can see this last photo here exactly the same picture was there on table the abdomen was showing that much lump in the infra umbilical region and it was a palpable lump which was up to firm firm in consistency so i was uh, very much uh, skeptical whether i should open it completely because as soon as you open up and you endure any bowel the patient is going to land up with fistula so i just uh, did a supra umbilical where there was no palpable lump and incision my aim was to just go in the abdomen sir wanted a piece of peritoneum for biopsy i took that out i didn't even touch bowel i didn't even look at the bowel closed the abdomen and came out Uh, Ravi, and the histopathology showed changes of sclerosing peritonitis like areas, and many giant foreign body giants and granules. No tuberculosis, no other pathology. We saw sclerosing peritonitis with areas showing many foreign body giants. So, uh, encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis is the new term which has been there because. some patients they may not have inflammation but you have what is there is a encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis so synonyms are many but abdominal cocoon is the common synonym primary is idiopathic where we don't get the cause where a uh, retrograde menstruation and other uh, possibilities are also thought of there are secondary causes like drug induced beta blockers asbestos chemotherapy 
peritoneal dialysis bp shunt intraperitoneal chemotherapy even after liver transplantation infections like tuberculosis cmv sarcoidosis so all these patients all these causes are described as secondary causes but i couldn't find a cause as pregnancy but i again personally think that it is something related to cesarean section where probably some foreign body has been put and as a reaction to that so the idea of presenting these two cases is what is always in our mind is tuberculosis tuberculosis both these Sir, you are both cases were very interesting. Recently, we have seen one case where after seizure, patient had bloating of abdomen, distension, and uh, patient was discharged. And the gynecologist was trying to avoid anything. Patient landed with us, and what we found was there was a dehiscence, <laughs> and, and there were <laughs> small bowel sticking to it, and causing small bowel obstruction. So yeah. We, Because of the reasons of and some of the loops were going inside the uterus. Okay, inside the uterus. With the complete reasons of the uterus, and the patient had hypoproteinemia because of that. Probably there was the. Uh, so nice cases both. Uh... In the first case, uh, could it be some connective tissue disorder which can present like this? we to be frank we haven't uh, investigated her from i think ana and other things were not done but she didn't have fever skin rash a joint pain and connective tissue disorder without these clinical symptoms presenting only as ascites basically we didn't think of that must confess that योगेश they can be there because of sepsis but they can also be there because of this entity in fact you see that vernik is this uh, caseosa difficult to pronounce the name also <laughs> so this entity is also associated with whitish plaques so in fact i was not knowing that such thing exist on the fetus which protects the fetus from the outside injury and that is possibly irritant to the abdomen kya ho raha hai bar bar kaise ah yes anybody any other comments our online chair person sir sit there yeah yeah please ask dr prashant yeah. prashant uh, sorry go ahead please you were asking something i wanted to ask if you, you have any comments or questions yeah um the two most common causes that we think of in postpartum ascites number one is of course pre exam eclampsia fluid overload then spilling over into the postpartum stage is a well known entity like uh, srikant mentioned the second is chylus ascites which for which there is no explanation it is presumed that the chylus ducts dilate during pregnancy and when there is a rapid decompression there is leakage from the lymphatics this is only a presumptive uh, explanation given but chylus ascites following pregnancy is also known the third entity that shrikant brought up so is uh, so well is that of uh, amniotic fluid peritonitis in fact when it happens uh, for the first time after pregnancy we always think of either spillage of amniotic fluid into the peritoneal cavity or during cesarean foreign body reaction because of the various materials that they use and you never know what you can develop allergy to there is a third or fourth entity that we talk about where no cause has been known but given the presence of hypoalbuminemia 
there is an explanation given saying that when there's a rapid decompression of uh, intra-abdominal pressures at the time of delivery, in the presence of hypoalbuminemia, there could be leakage from the peritoneal surface. But that almost always is a low protein fluid, unlike the high protein fluid in this patient. So chylocystitis as secondary to pregnancy, and of course, apart from the, all the other causes like Bhatkari syndrome and BOD, and uh, amniotic fluid peritonitis and foreign body peritonitis are the three things we would think of in the presence of high protein ascites in this case. Yeah. In the second case where we talked about sclerosing or fibrosing peritonitis, of course, any foreign body can do that. Any infection and tuberculosis is a known infection that can lead to that. The other thought that comes to mind is whether we should also think in some of these cases of IgG4. Yeah. Yeah. We know about retroperitoneal fibrosis, but peritoneal fibrosis also is known. Although the few cases that we have sent the IgG4 and done a staining, we've always had it negative. But I think we should still keep that in mind. Yeah, IgG4 is a good uh, suggestion. In fact, uh, we should have done it, but we haven't done it. But um, IgG4 is one of the uh, differential diagnoses. We agree. Thanks for your suggestion, Philip. Thanks, Shrikant. Thank you, sir, for such interesting cases and thought-provoking cases. Uh, if we don't have any other questions from the audience, shall we move on to the next case? That is uh, removal of subepithelial lesions with endoscopy by Dr. Saurabh Mukhar, sir. Hmm. Hi, good evening, everyone. Could you put the videos in the presentation? In the yeah, so today I'm going to um, talk about uh, nothing fancy. It's a very simple. Uh, uh, easy cases, so to speak, with endoscopy. Uh, so th this is the, the idea is just to uh, sort of highlight and uh, and sensitize people to uh, the options that we have available uh, with endoscopy. Uh, that's really it. So a couple of cases here. This is a 35 year old male with history of epigastric pain, burning sensation since one year. Uh, presented uh, and had an endoscopy which revealed an esophageal sort of a nodule at the lower end, and uh, was, was uh, taken up for further evaluation at, uh, at our center. Uh, the patient uh, sometimes are apprehensive of nodules and they want them removed. So here's what we did on the endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, we could identify this lesion about one centimeters. It was not very big, uh, but uh, we decided to proceed with uh, a, a plan for removal. Now, these are small lesions, you can't biopsy, and uh, therefore you need to uh, ultimately, sorry, I'm just going to pause it. So, so just before we start there, see, these are small lesions, about one to 1.5 centimeters. So your mucosal biopsies will not reveal it. US Garrett biopsies are not feasible because they are too small. So the real options are uh, having periodic surveillance which is uh, subjecting them to another endoscopic ultrasound every uh, couple of years, or uh, you know, going ahead and removal of these lesions. So we decided to proceed with removal of the lesion. And what I'm performing is a submucosal uh, tunneling and endoscopic removal technique. And I'm showing you what we, uh, as some of you must have seen the third space videos with poem. So it's very similar to that. We go about five centimeters proximal to the lesion and uh, here we are making an entry into the submucosal space with the help of our knives. And slowly this endoscope is advanced into the tunnel. And then we perform gentle dissection. And as you can uh, see on the right of the screen, you know, at the bottom is a white uh, tumor that we can identify. So what we essentially perform is gentle dissection around the tumor. And uh, the goal is to have and uh, obtain uh, an intact specimen. So in this particular case, uh, Oh, you try to go away from the capsule margins so you don't leave anything uh, inside. So we go a little deeper. Now you can see this tumor is involving the muscle layer as well. So I have to go a little deeper through the muscle layer to further uh, perform dissection. And uh, 
So then we go ahead and we're to move yeah, yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. Nice and then basically it's been nicely dissected out there, I suppose here. And then we, yeah, and then we come out and close the entry side with multiple clips. So the uh, so this, the advantage is uh, with this approach, it uh, for smaller legions, this, this was a total procedure time was basically 26 minutes. So it's really an outpatient procedure, which we can just go in, remove, come back. Although we keep the patient overnight for observation, I suspect we can you know discharge the patient in an hour or so. Uh, another patient here, 48 year old female with upper abdominal pain, fullness, nausea, and uh, had functional dyspepsia uh, as a clinical diagnosis. Upper GI endoscopy revealed a subepithelial bulge just below the G junction. Now this is this was distal esophagus, the first case. This was just below the G junction, and uh, and a, yeah. And uh, here is the endoscopic ultrasound view. What I'll do is pause here for a second. So on the right of the screen, this uh, black round structure is the lesion. And uh, I will uh, move forward. So that's the lesion, about 1.5 by 1 centimeter. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this is the lesion over here. And this lesion was arising from the submucosal layer based on our assessment. So again, uh, similar to the first case I showed you, uh, what can sometimes get interesting in these lesions is uh, losing the way, which has happened to us before in our prior uh, attempts at removal of these lesions. Again, similar to the first case, uh, we proceed with the uh, mucosal entry and uh, five cent about three to five centimeters above the lesion. And then again, we are right there tunneling our way in through the submucosa. I'm going to move forward a little bit. So on the, yeah, now you see on the left of the screen, uh, we can we can identify the lesion. And now it's, uh, even in this particular case, it was going inside the muscle layer, although it was arising from the submucosal space and also involving the muscle layer. And uh, again, just sort of go gentle, slowly and steadily. Let's move forward real quick. So this is what was removed about 1.5 to 2 centimeters. And again, place clips and we're out. So again, this took us about 34 minutes to uh, finish the case. So uh, overall, uh, just talking about the fact that uh, these are legions which are difficult to biopsy and uh, and for those who do endoscopic ultrasound, uh, you don't want to put a needle across because if you want to perform this procedure, uh, we are going in tunneling. So you don't want any adhesion between the lesion and the mucosa, which is overlying. Because the idea of doing this procedure is that you go proximal, tunnel in, remove the lesion, come out. So there's no connection between the defect that's closed at the bottom and the mucosa. And therefore we don't prefer anybody tampering with the lesion from the mucosal side, uh, just for anybody who's ever thinking of biopsying or sending or doing this patient later, uh, what happens is the lesion then can have fibrosis and can get stuck to the mucosa. And then that will uh, prevent this procedure from being done successfully, uh, can cause problems. So if you look at subepithelial tumors, when we say subepithelial, it's below the mucosa basically, and it can be in various flavors. Uh, what we had was more of a a C or a B, more like a B, where it was in mucosa, but also involved the muscle layer. But it can be a D, which is all intramuscular, and or, or, or A, where it's mostly outside. And these are the sort of harder ones because you may lose these tumors in the peritoneum or thoracoscopic cavity if you're not careful in removing them. So if uh, this is what essentially we did in a cartoon. This is uh, A is when we inject and lift the mucosa. B, the scope enters the submucosa and we do C, which is a tunneling and a dissection around the tumor. And uh, basically E, you take the tumor out and close the entry site. So uh, I apologize. I think uh, the patch specimen report was not there. I think we forgot to put it. So it's a, both, both had actually leomyomas. So sorry for that. Uh, so if you look at, uh, this is what we call as a STIR procedure, submucosal tunneling and endoscopic uh, resection. If you look at series, various series across uh, and mostly the Chinese are actually very good at it. And they do a lot and a lot of these procedures. Look at the series number four, they've done 290 of these procedures. 
It's a large number. So if you look at the data, the mean size about two centimeters. Uh, procedure time, they're pretty fast and uh, between it's up to 60 minutes, 50 to 60 minutes. On block resection rates are quite pretty, pretty uh, good. I would say a lot of 100%, about upwards of 90% most series. Patients have adverse events. Not sure if this is related to not using uh, carbon dioxide in, in their patients, because most of them had some sort of a pneumothorax or pneumoperitoneum. And uh, recurrence rates were very small. So uh, essentially, it's a fairly uh, good procedure. And uh, I'm going to move forward here, this uh, comparison, right? Because for esophageal lesions, uh, a thoracoscopic approach uh, is the alternative. Uh, this is a study essentially comparing for large lesions, more than five centimeters, a endoscopic approach was essentially very similar to the uh, thoracoscopic approach with similar on-block resection rates, uh, similar uh, sort of adverse events and uh, uh, post-operative use of thoraco, uh, thoracic tube was lower with endoscopy and the procedure time expectedly was a little lower with endoscopy in these cases. But of course, these are expert uh, uh, centers. So just, uh, I think I'm going to move real far, fast here. Just for everybody to understand, we are using all these new procedures, terminologies. Uh, this is endoscopic submucosal dissection, which basically means you're performing dissection of the submucosa and remove the entire lesion from top. Endoscopic full thickness resection is a term, which is another term used for all your people to understand. On the left is a full thickness resection. You go on top of the lesion, remove the entire lesion. There's a complete defect, a perforation, and then you close it. Now, this is something that uh, can be done, but we don't have great tools and the tools available for closing are expensive. So that's why STIR is a more preferred approach. And uh, just last few slides, comparing STIR with uh, ESD or EFTR for these lesions, overall uh, similar uh, R0 on block resection rates, recurrence and worse event rates. Procedure time was actually uh, shorter with endoscopic full thickness resection because you just go on top and remove the entire lesion. But the Chinese are good at it, and we don't have great closure tools, so we do not recommend it for the most part now. And uh, these are some sort of preferred approaches based on the location, as uh, along the lesser curvature, we prefer a stir approach. On fundus, we use the endoscopic full thickness resection approach. And along the greater curve of curvature further down, either of these approaches can be used. And I'll just end it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Happy to take any questions here. Hello, um, Swaroop. Hi. Yes, hi, Rachit. Yes, yeah, thank hi. you. Great third space stuff as always. Uh, yes, we do expect more fancier things. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I, say, I have a question. Showing so, a one centimeter subepithelial removal is not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's more difficult than but the bigger is. ones, I think. Uh, my question was <clears throat> since we do expect that a lot of these times this would be uh, leomyoma or benign condition, in literature, there's any stuff uh, regarding the size where we can expect. That is, this is likely to be malignant and this is likely to be benign where we can follow yeah. up because everybody may not be able to do third space. So from that aspect, any... Right. So I think the question is, which what is the threshold? By and large, two centimeters is your threshold. Oftentimes, uh, one centimeter lesions, people are comfortable letting them be and advice just to follow up. Uh, two centimeters is a, is a reasonable threshold where we talk about uh, removal. Yes. Or uh, having a close observation and of course, biopsying these lesions because... Uh, uh, gists uh, and so forth would be you desire that you want to take them out above two centimeters. The problem with these less than two centimeters is that you want to sample it, it will affect your ability to remove it. So yes, you could sample and say, okay, there's a leomyoma, just let it be. But then you, when you want to, if you had to remove it, then it can be a problem. So uh, this was simple enough that I said, let's just take it out, keep it simple, get it out and you're fine. Uh, so that was one way of looking at it. Certainly, there can be a counter argument whether you just don't do anything and follow them up every year or every couple of years, which is a reasonable thing to do as well, an alternative option. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. yes. Uh, Saurabh, sir. Excellent presentation again. Uh, my question is that you have demonstrated two cases. Now, these were straightforward uh, lower esophageal uh, tu subepithelial tumors mm -hmm. where you can directly dissect a plane and go ahead and just remove the tumor. They were not pretty large in size. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose you have a large lesion. Like, How do you decide based on the size uh, which approach to choose that is exposed versus non-exposed, tunneling versus non-tunneling, depending upon the size of the tumor? Because if you have a larger tumor, I think it would be difficult for you to grab it and get it out from the mucosal uh, yeah. Uh, incision. No, good question. So 
So that's so the first question is uh, uh, size wise. I, I think the, the, the approach is not so much so dependent on the size uh, as much as it's dependent on the morphology location and uh, uh, the, 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 the extra luminal extension, so to speak. So if it's something that is extending outside and has, has a more extra luminal component, maybe an endoscopic approach is not a great idea as you may not successfully remove it. Uh, the lesion, what is the upper limit? By and large, most people say up to four to five centimeters, an endoscopic approach is considered okay. Yes, there are, we have done a patient with six centimeters. We'll present it sometime next time, uh, but yes, can be done. Not that it cannot be done. So uh, whether it's, whether the approach should be complete exposure, removal, and then closing the defect. Yes, that is a desirable, that's an alternative option. But closing the defect, you need uh, cheaper, good tools. The only thing what we can do is a clip loop technique right now, which is uh, affordable for our patients. We can't have suturing done. It's not affordable. So clip loop technique can be done, but then, you know, depending on the location, whether you, you don't exactly approximate the edges with clip loop, you keep them next to each other. So there is a little bit of a leak always. I'm not very impressed with that technique. I've done it a couple of times. I'm not very impressed. So I still am wary of doing a full thickness removal right now. Can be done, but these are the issues. So that's my approach is STIR or ESD for the most part, basically, yeah. Nice, uh, quick cases, Saurabh. Thank you. We see such cases almost once a week, mm -hmm. these small lesions. Yeah. So uh, can there be a guideline where you can say definitely don't do anything, not even surveillance? Like Yeah. So. There are cases which we have removed, which were very superficial, uh, deep mucosa with ESDs and small lesions. Uh, as, you, as you have pointed out, it's a very common occurrence. So these were submucosal deeper lesions and uh, two centimeters would be a reasonable threshold. If you don't want to touch it, it's totally fine. You can wait and advise a follow-up in say a couple of years. Uh, esophageal by and large are lyomyoma, so they may not be enough or become such big lesions to cause problems, but a gist or any other of those diagnoses can cause problems. So a two centimeters is a good threshold. Okay. Well, one uh, technical question. What is your preferred uh, current for uh, tunneling? A swift or a spray or uh, any we, other? We use a VIO3. So that has a, a precise sect setting. Okay. So that the is latest one. Okay. Got yeah, it. that's the newer uh, RB that has it because the other RB modules yeah, don't have it. So that is what I use. But you can use, uh, you know, spray, but then it can damage the scope and the uh, knife. You want to use it. <laughs> that's fine. Sir, yeah, yeah. So in these years, we at MR, we always forget the laparoscope and thoracoscope. Of course, so yes. What is the threshold margin where uh, you would say it's better to go up with the laparoscope or thoracoscope? You know, four to five centimeters is what we have typically considered a threshold for endoscopy. As you are familiar with the case we did, which was five or six centimeters removal. Actually, that case we'll present later. We did everything, but removal was a nightmare. And then we so had that tumor, that much big tumor coming out to upper exposure center also for this. Yeah, that, it, yeah, those are some other practical challenges after removal. Four to six centimeters is your borderline. Uh, we have one more um, yes. online uh, chairperson, Dr. Rahul Lokhandi. Do you have any questions? Oh, I think he's pressing there. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Philip Abraham has conveyed that he is, uh, we wanted to leave at 10 o'clock. He okay, tried okay. calling up uh, Shrikan, sir. So, he called me and said he is leaving. Oh, okay. Okay. thank you. Uh, yeah, Saurabh, sir, one more question. Yes, please. Considering this. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, considering this, some epithelial tumors, they don't have much of lymphatic spread or malignant potential. How yeah. important is it to get a R0 resection and uh, margin while dissecting it? Uh, if you have to choose between creating a defect and getting the entire specimen out, how do you decide on that? Do you do US characterization before that and see whether if it's a gist or mm -hmm. what type of tumor? Or... Right. So US doesn't always help um, 100%. It may sway you one way or the other. It doesn't tell you by a, you know 100% that this is just all I'm at, number one. Uh, second thing is uh, we always want to go ahead on get on block resection, considering that 
you know, you're there for a reason to remove the entire lesion. So what's the point of leaving anything in there? Now, question is, uh, where would you sacrifice? And you'd say, no, listen, I don't want to go deep. I don't want to expose the peritoneum or thoracoscopic cavity. By and large, it's okay to expose because it's part and parcel of getting an on-block resection. You will expose the thoracoscopic cavity and it's, you, you will see, you'll visualize it. But the point is that the technique has to be right where your entry side is closed correctly and there's no mucosal rupture. I think that's the key, more importantly. Uh, I would not leave any tissue behind in the interest of not exposing cavity. You remove everything, but make sure a closure is proper. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the excellent Thank presentation. Uh, so if you don't have any other questions from the audience, can we move ahead with our next case? Next case is difficult CBD stone presented by Dr. Bhushan Bhavre. Good evening, all of you. So uh, let me start with the case of uh, a 46 year old male uh, presented with an uh, chief symptoms of an uh, abdominal pain since two months, jaundice since one month and itching since last one month. Uh, he's a known case of an uh, retroviral disease on uh, ART and uh, in, uh, since 2016 and was put on second line ART because of failure of first line since 2018. Uh, on the detailed history, patient has a similar episodes of pain and jaundice in the past and the LFTs which were recorded from 2019 suggest you have some obstructive pattern uh, which is progressively increasing, the highest bilirubin reaching around 10 uh, with uh, uh, alkaline phosphatase elevated more than the transaminitis. Uh, there is some alteration of the total protein albumin ratio with uh, normal PTINR and outside ultrasound suggest of mild changes of a chronic liver disease in the form of an altered eco-texture, mild splenomegaly. And endoscopy done in 2019 suggests to offend some portal hypertensive gastropathy without any evidence of an esophageal or gastric varices. Uh, yeah, so in 2020, when the bilirubin was quite rising, MRCP was performed at outside. We showed there is a uh, dilated left intrahepatic built radical with, uh, uh, with a left uh, hepatic duct uh, beyond it, uh, with hepatic duct calculi beyond it. There is a mild narrowing also noticed at the primary confluence, and there is also a presence of an gallbladder stone. Uh, so by the time in June 2022, when the jaundice was rising, he was, he was seen outside, and this is an MRCP report, which can see there is a there is a, a def, arrow can point it. We can be able to see also there is an there is a narrowing at the side of the confluence, and there is a large stones beyond uh, and the, uh, beyond that uh, uh, narrowing, uh, which can seen isolated in the left hepatic duct. Yeah. So this is an MRCP report, which was done in the same center, which report the size of a stone is around 2.3 into 1.1 centimeter. Uh, there is a large gallbladder calculi, and also there is some filling defects in the terminal end of the CBD also. Uh, so uh, on general examination, patient appearing a coiled icteric, there is no signs of any chronic liver disease, per abdomen appears normal. So this is latest investigation done in June 2022, which can see that jaundice has risen up to, up to uh, bilirubin up to 12.12. Uh, with elevated alkaline phosphatase, there is some alteration of total al protein albumin ratio, normal uh, uh, PTINR, and CD4 count by the time it was in, uh, was around 1200. Uh, so we made a syndromic diagnosis that patient is on HIV. He is an HIV uh, on second line NRT, uh, uh, ART. He is having a gradually progressive painful type of an obstructive jaundice. Uh, there is some suspicion of an uh, cirrhosis in the form of an imaging which showing some altered eco texture of a liver. Yeah, uh, so, uh, the blood report showing us some alteration of into albumin to albumin globulin ratio. There is no evidence of any cholangitis, GI bleed, weight loss, and MRCP suggests to have a higher structure with an proximal large left intrahepatic stones. There is a smaller distal CBD stones and the gallbladder stones. I really put up this question to our jury, uh, to our uh, audience, and also the our chairperson. So, what can be your possibility of this patient? Yes. HIV. HIV cholangiopathy can be one possibility. Okay. So malignancy should always be considered. Yes. IgG4 disease can be considered. Absolutely. <coughs> uh, RPC. Absolutely, sir. RPC. Yeah, absolutely. It, is a, it is a classical or uh, whatever. So we, but we also come RPC. into a conclusion whether the patient has developed some secondary biliary cirrhosis due to a prolonged obstruction RPC. in the form of stones and stricture. 
and as you say the stones and sticks are can be because of some rpc or some disease uh, it can be an hiv cholangiopathy and malignancy but once you go into literature uh, uh, rpc presenting without cholangitis no cholangitic abscess so long duration is very unlikely there is no features of any cholangitis no evidence that patient has any any course down in the for that patient having some fever hiv cholangiopathy is very very likely to be presented when the cd4 count is very low like cd4 less than less than 100 was caused by some cryptosporidium parvum this guy has a cd4 count of more about 1200 so very unlikely and hiv cholangiopathy is very unlikely to develop a stones it is more like a papillary stenosis with some stricturizing in the intrahepatic and extrahepatic duct uh yes malignancy as sir say yes malignancy can be a part of this that, that, that there is a stricture which is formed because of malignancy and stone has be, uh, developed beyond that uh, stricture so we found all these possibilities was uh, I, uh, at this four IgG4 cholangiopathy also sir uh, i wonder ki IgG4 cholangiopathy the, the 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 age group is more elderly uh, the pancreas distal uh, distal structures are much more common like it is an IgG4 related disorders isolated stones and, and confluence may be very unlikely form of an IgG4 related cholangiopathy but it can be uh, possible so can you have you have yeah sir and again so a three years is rct both right and left breast are right side breast of the intrahepatic tracts are not right yeah सर मतलब एंड प्रेजेंटिंग एट सच लेटर इट कैन प्रेजेंट सो इट इज अटरल इट इज एट अन्फ्लुएंस इट एट अन्फ्लुएंस स्ट्रक्चर एट अन्फ्लुएंस इट मे कॉज डायलेक्शन एट बोथ द साइड नॉट लाइक प्रोनिंग ऑफ Achha. So you want to pick the you want to pick for that PSC can be one of the possibilities. Yeah. So so it can be. Yeah. Central duct. Yeah, sir. Central IGR is there. Peripheral yeah, IGR is not there. Right, sir. It's obstructive pathology, a stricture. Hmm. Then the dilatation should be parallel going up to the distal duct. So yeah, I was uh, getting at that uh, whether it's uh, kind of some other kind of sclerosing cholangitis apart from AIDS cholangiopathy and of course the pruning is one of the uh, th thing you are saying this could this looks like also is underlying chronic liver disease so the IGBR may not be dilated if this underlying Absolutely. chronic liver at what what sir of saying if you see the left ducts the proximal ducts intrahepatic ducts are still dilated no no in fact डायलिटेशन <laughs> a biliary cirrhosis uh yeah so so we did a further investigation like ca 19.9 was normal uh, and we repeated an endoscopy we show it no no varices we uh, having a portal hypertensive gastropathy so again i just uh, put forward a question so what can be a management option for this patient sir what we can see with all this possibility now patient has presented with us with an jaundice which is progressive painful and this is an mrcp report of this patient Yeah, if you have cholangioscope available, spyglass, you would do a spyglass and try to evaluate the strictures area. Absolutely. Now also put stents, uh, try to break the stones with uh, laser lithotripsy, and these are these are the options. Absolutely. Any other? Okay, yeah. So we have option as per se. We have a very strong endoscopy option. We have a traditional uh, method of doing a hepatic tummy portion. Or if can be a say per cutaneous uh, cholangio uh, transhepatic cholangioscopy and lithotripsy can also option. But yes, we are at an endoscopy center where we perform a uh, uh, the spy uh, parallel cholangioscopy and perform lithotripsy. So with that intent, we first did an uh, did an ERCP. So we uh, we cannulate and uh, we cannulate and CBD. 
uh, we, uh, we we try to obtain our guide wire into a left hepatic duct and uh, we obtained a air cholangiogram small contrast was injected uh, just to demonstrate there was definitely the uh, picture is just demonstrating as like an mrcp we do a biliary sphincterotomy and as sir say we initially dilated the uh, dilated the stricture uh, uh, with a hurricane balloon also do an uh, papilloplasty uh and also put an uh, double stain in the left hepatic duct so that we can plan for an cholangoscopy and laser lithotripsy so this was as, as sir said we did a plan for we we put an stain for this uh, stricture and uh, wait for her so by the time uh, we planned for this cholangoscopy within two weeks uh, patient developed a severe colon patient presented with us with a severe cholangitis jaundice has risen up from 12 to 20 and patient had developed a decomposition patient has developed an ascites which is an high sac low protein ascites uh, the creatinine has rose up from 1.2 to 1.9. So, so this patient uh, with, within a within a two weeks, uh, maybe because of I wonder the stain has blocked or there is some uh, some if we induce some cholangitis. Patient has presented uh, with cholangitis and decompensation. So here we plan on that time that we should stabilize the patient with antibiotic IV fluids, exchange the stain if it blocked, and we subject to cholangoscopy as soon as uh, the patient uh, becomes uh, stable for laser lithotripsy. So we did the same. So we removed the stain. We can see a biliary sphincterplasty site. We again cannulate the left hepatic duct, and now this time again uh, we dilated the stricture. We can see a mild opening of the stricture as compared to the index ERCP. Yeah. And again we dilate uh, dilated the stricture, and this time also we can see the stone and stricture very nicely seen in the left hepatic duct. Though it is, an, we can see it's not a single calcula which has seen the left hepatic. It's a multiple calcula, and we again put a stain to uh, to make forward for cholangoscopy. And yes, uh, by uh, after almost four five uh, almost uh, almost four five days of uh, having an antibiotic stain, we we subjected the patient for um, uh, for cholangoscopy. So on cholangoscopy image, the stricturizing size appear more about edematous, for which I think we we also perform a spy bite, uh, and we can see a large stone is obstructing a left hepatic duct. We did a, a laser lithotripsy for uh, for around uh, forty five to forty five to uh, fifty minutes. Let's move forward. You can see uh, quite uh, there is a we can achieve the fragmentation of the calculi. Yes. So destroyed before destroyed. <laughs> yeah. So then starting with the we, then after uh, doing a uh, fragmentation of the stone, we start to remove by mega by, by by basket. So all the stones which you can see which has been able to remove. So and again we put a stain into the uh, uh, into the left hepatic duct and also this time a right hepatic duct also. So this is the stone we can structure is completely open. The stone has been almost ninety five percent has been cleared off. So post procedure patient uh, developed mild uh, pancreatitis which was managed conservatively. Patient was discharged day four of the post procedure and the spy bite which was obtained with suggestion of more of an inflammatory type of the structure rather than the, rather than any uh, any malignant form this patient is having. Uh, the patient came uh, to us in August 2022. Now the patient having complete resolution of anesthetics, though we we manage in the form of an uh, diuretics. Um, uh, the left has has uh, has com completely become normalized. With not exactly, but it was bilirubin like 2.1. And uh, this time we also in a cholangiogram we submitted a complete uh, resolution of an structure. And there is no stone residual, uh, no residual stone remaining. Inside the uh, left hepatic duct. So, in summary, we have a 46 year old male patient with an ICH on second line ART had an episode of painful obstructive jaundice. MRCP showed a stricture and the stone. We underwent an EMR, MRC, uh, ERCP with stricture dilatation and stenting. Had episode of cholangitis which was managed by um, managed by stenting and under subsequently underwent cholangoscopy, laser lithotripsy with complete clearance of stone. And also, patient is awaiting for his gallbladder surgery since patient is now a chronic mole some having a decompensation. And now he's really uh, really having some concerns regarding we should go for gallbladder surgery or not. So, reading about some hepatolithiasis. So, uh, the, as you know, that hepatolithiasis is very uncommon in India. Hepatolithiasis is mostly found in the Southeast Asia, which incidence is more about 20% in Japan and Taiwan. As you all know, that hepatolithiasis is mainly caused because of one of the things, because of infection. It can be a bacterial infection or some liver flukes, which can lead to the chronic stasis of the bile, uh, which can lead to the inflammation and stricture formation and subsequently a stone formation. Just uh, uh, as you all know that uh, 
as as dr bangsar say that yes the gold standard is definitely an left hepatectomy that uh, that will solve a lot of problems in the form of complete removal of the stone the resection and also <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it still it still dilated yeah right right maybe dilate so yes but but in literature sir in literature the treatment of choice for an uh, for a isolated left hepatic duct stone uh, though a stone is um, is hepatectomy as recommended but now the treatment has been evolving and currently a conservative approach is being attempted per operator single, single operator cholangoscopy is an endoscopic technique which is used for treating a complex bile and pancreatic duct stones this is a very recent uh, retrospective study came in journal of clinical medicine in 2022 where they found the usefulness of the per oral cholangoscopy for intrahepatic stones and they have found that a complete stone removal was achieved in 94% of the patient at least at least minimum uh, session of 3 to 4 ERCP So, in take-home message, the treatment of hepatitis is really evolving, and single operator per operator cholangoscopy with lithotripsy is effective and safe alternative in experience. And thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very yes, sir. Yes, sir. For that, we answered by we took an spy bite for this patient and uh, demonstrated it is more about mild inflammatory stricture rather than any tuberculotic uh, any any form of tuberculosis. So, yeah, it is more about direct hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, what we present is uh, sickle cell would have been present more indirect type of hyperbilirubinemia if the patient is vented hemolysis. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, sir. Pigment type of stone. That means, sir, pigment type of stones. it is mostly emtricetabine and uh, uh, this uh, tenofovir and one more drug i think sir can fail fail to recall this thing so uh, i think i was practically not in it here so one thing is uh, i we at the end of the day we still don't know why there was picture Question: Whether the stones led to a structure, chronic inflammation from the stone, which is why it was common in this case. So that remains uh, as far as we know. Did we find ourselves? just one question uh, considering that you have done complete ductal clearance for this patient now since the patient has developed one history of uh, cholangitis and decompensation uh, when would you consider giving this patient a stent free trial suppose patient we come already, uh, patient is already on stent free trial yeah the last year see what we came in august 20 uh, this thing we achieved we for we complete clearance and patient is on stent free uh, stent free trial absolutely sir absolutely 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 sir i am also yeah absolutely sir i will give up, get back to you on this i am also very interesting to know what is the recurrence of this thing whether it recur in this thing it ranges from 3.2 but rose up to 20 even cholangitis yes yeah, sir yeah 
thank you so uh, okay before starting i'll just end this talk uh, recurrent pyogenic cholangitis with isolated left lobe involvement the treatment of choice is still hepatectomy okay uh, yeah. i think you not in this he is not rpc he is not rpc that's why i said i never said hepatectomy for this he is not rpc but uh, indication of left hepatectomy is a recurrent pyogenic cholangitis isolated left lobe involvement it's still hepatectomy so uh, can i get the lights off okay. sir can i start yeah yes i notice you stood up for your last case so might as well get started yeah so this is a case of a corrosive esophageal stricture i uh, we had to operate this patient and dr unmit chandak sir helped me out with this case uh, thanks to him i'll be presenting this case now uh, can i get the lights off please so march 2021 a young boy had a history of corrosive ingestion which was suicidal in intent uh, he had toilet clean he uh, took toilet cleaner uh, uh, primary treatment was done in sedol by keeping the patient nil by mouth who was given iv fluid there was no rails tube insertion done that time there was no endoscopy being done that time and he was discharged after 5 days being stable uh since march uh, till uh, the time he presented to us by june progressively over 3 months he started having dysphagia initially to solids and when he came to us the dysphagia was given to the liquids so he came to us in june 2021 with dysphagia for both solids and liquids he was taking only sips of water and saliva i am not having the barium uh, swallow uh, picture here but the barium swallow was showing a short segment uh, stricture with irregular mucosal pattern in upper esophagus and another long segment stricture with irregular mucosal pattern was seen in lower esophagus so uh, this patient was taken up for balloon dilatation as you can see this was the upper esophageal stricture uh, through which a guide wire was inserted and it was dilated then the, this is the lower esophageal stricture to which uh, the endoscopist went and a balloon dilatation of this stricture was done uh, this was done uh, like 3 uh, months after the primary uh, intake of the uh, corrosive so this is the first endoscopy for this patient 3 months after the intake of uh, uh, corrosive and the balloon dilatation of uh, the stricture was done uh, up to 8 mm and then uh, after uh, just getting a little bit of opening of that uh, stricture the endoscopist came out with the intention of going in again after 15 days so this was the upper esophageal sphincter opened up with sg dilators and then uh, the lower esophageal stricture was a balloon uh, dilatation was done up to 8 so a uh, patient in the night of the dilatation had left pneumothorax and once uh, uh, this episode which was done uh, stabilizes so this was done in june 30th and on uh, uh, 4th july we did feeding jejunostomy so one and half month later on 12th of august the patient came back to us uh, this time again uh, a dilatation was planned so you can see as soon as the um, scope was entered there is a pin hole uh, esophagus uh, in the around uh, 15 to 20 cm from the incisors so esophageal stricture was upper esophageal stricture that is the pin hole esophagus you can see there uh, a guide wire was uh, uh, passed and a dilatation was done up to 11 mm sg dilatation was possible in the upper esophagus and then uh, uh, the scope went up to the lower esophagus where uh, a biliary balloon dilatation was done and after that guide wire was passed into the stomach and a 9 mm dilatation was done for the lower esophageal stricture and then uh, steroid was injected so this is the first uh, this is the second dilatation the first one had a bit of pneumothorax uh, probably perforation and then one and half month later after stabilization this was the uh, dilatation done so upper esophagus was opened up very nicely and then the lower esophagus was seen here a uh, biliary balloon dilatation followed by sg dilatation was done till now we have not assessed the stomach patient didn't have any vomiting patient was tolerating feeding jejunostomy very well after dilatation he used to tolerate uh, uh, liquids uh, very well so during this second dilatation a rails tube was placed across uh, the dilated uh, esophagus so that the lumen patency can be there so uh, this was exactly after 12 days the patient was asked to be on a serial dilatation every 2 uh, weeks uh, rails tube was removed and then uh, the lower uh, stricture was dilated with sg again this time and steroids were injected so you can see this is a fractured uh, stricture 
a mucosa is seen in between. And this was uh, the first endoscopy when a stomach could be seen. Stomach was absolutely normal. Uh, the endoscopist can go up to the duodenum. There was no gastric outlet obstruction or no evidence of any damage in the stomach. So that is the uh, uh, stricture dilatation being done in August. So patient came again in 2nd September, exactly 15 days later. And when the endoscopy was done again, there was a pinhole in the upper esophagus through which again a guide wire was inserted and then dilatation was done from 7 to 11 mm and steroid was injected. 29th September patient came, this same 11 mm was extended up to 15 mm and uh, sorry, uh, this 11 mm was extended up 12.8 mm as the dilatation was done and sequentially steroid was injected. So till now we have around uh, uh, four dilatations being done and then he was uh, uh, subjected to multiple dilatations, 24th October up to 15 mm. Then 24th of November, he came back again with that pinpoint hole. Again, we had to start from 5 mm and go up to 14 mm. So here, first time it was labeled as a refractory stricture because he was coming again and again with the pinpoint hole. And uh, uh, again, the dilatation was done. In February 2022, he was referred for surgery considering that every time the patient is coming up with the complete uh, uh, dilatation being done, but within a month, he's coming back with the complete stricture. And on 16th April, the surgery was done. So this is a corrosive injury uh, esophagus with a complex recurrent stricture, considering that patient is having this stricture again and again after dilatation. And before surgery, this was the barium which was done, which was showing a short segment stricture in the upper esophagus, a very well dilated esophagus, and then a long segment stricture lower down. So we planned for uh, ileocolonic pull-up or a colonic conduit surgery for this patient as the stomach was normal. We thought of uh, uh, keeping the stomach for him as a... Um... So the surgery begins by mobilizing the colon. After opening up the abdomen, we start mobilizing the colon. That is the ascending colon, which is in our hand. We are mobilizing it from the uh, uh, duodenum. That is the duodenum we will be seeing there. So uh, the aim is to take up the... Uh, colon. So that is the duodenum you are seeing. That is the head of pancreas through which we have separated the uh, ascending colon completely. We have taken down the hepatic flexure and that is the colon which has come up in our hand. Next is separation of omentum. We want to take up the colon in the chest. So we don't want the omentum to go with it up in the chest. So the omentum is separated from the colon and the uh, omentum is kept with the stomach. As we come here, this is the gastrocolic trunk a vessel which connects the colon and stomach. It has to be taken care of. So we ligate that. Uh, care is to be taken not to damage any vasculature of colon during this time because any loss of vessel, a vein or an artery, the conduit might not be very much useful. It might show some ischemic changes. Now here, the most important aspect I'll just tell you, these are the vessels of colon. That is the uh, uh, ascending, I'll show you in a while. So that is the left colic branch, the blue colored, which came up ascending branch of left colic artery. The yellow one, which is coming up is the middle colic artery. That is the most important vessel, which we want on which the conduit is going to go up in the chest. Then there is a right colic artery or light colic vessel, which is very small in most of the patients. This patient surprisingly had a very large ileocolic vessel. That is the large ileocolic vessel. And now all these vessels are connected to each other with these green marginal vessels. So we have to keep intact the marginal vessels. We have to keep intact the middle colic vessels and also right colic vessel if possible. So we first take down the ileocolic vessel. We ligate that at the base because until unless we ligate that, we won't be able to take the colon up. So we have seen that we are ligating that ileocolic vessel exactly at the base. And once that is done, we cut the colon along with ileum and we apply a bulldog on the middle colic vessel to see whether the marginal vessels which I had shown are supplying the blood till the tip of the colon which we want to take up. So the bulldog is applied there, you're seeing there, the bulldog is applied on middle colic vessels. Next we create a tunnel just posterior to the sternum. This is the retrosternal tunnel which we are creating. Our conduit is going to enter the neck through this tunnel. We are not going to remove the damaged esophagus. It's a esophagus which had already suffered one perforation, corrosive, multiple dilatations. So it is going to be a very messy affair in the chest. So we don't remove this colon, uh, sorry, esophagus. Here we are now in the final stages of making our conduit. 
we have ligated the right colic artery because it's not going up in the neck. So that right colic vessel is also ligated and then we will be getting our conduit up to the neck completely. So now the conduit is being made and you can see the conduit is coming above the sternum till the neck completely where we want it. So if it is coming above the chest, retrosternally it is going to go up to the neck easily without any tension. We insert a rice tube inside this so that uh, it becomes a stiff conduit in our hand and we can pass it through the retrosternal tunnel easily till the neck. Once that is done, we'll be opening up the neck. That is another difficult area to tackle with because uh, 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 there is a stricture in the upper esophagus and a patient had multiple times uh, dilatation and all. So the uh, main area is to separate this conduit, uh, this esophagus from the trachea. So we are palpating the esophagus there with the Hegar's dilator as you can see there. And we have to separate this esophagus from the trachea. So that is the blue one, which is esophagus posteriorly and the green one above is the trachea. We'll separate, uh, we'll go into the tracheoesophageal groove and separate that esophagus from the trachea and get a good uh, length of the esophagus. So, uh, uh, one good thing about this patient was we had a good length of esophagus and it was a good dilated esophagus. So we were a bit uh, relaxed for the neck anastomosis. Now the tunnel, uh, which we had created retrosternal tunnel to complete that in the neck region, we have to take care of the left uh, clavicle, the medial end of clavicle is cut so that we get a complete tunnel and the colon will come out through this end inside the neck. So that is the finger, which is coming out through the tunnel. You can see the surgeon is putting the finger through the tunnel into the neck. We have cut the esophagus. The damaged native esophagus is going to stay in the posterior mediastinum as it is. The tunnel, uh, the conduit is going to come up in the tunnel now. And once it comes in the neck, we'll do the esophago colic anastomosis in the neck. So here, you are seeing both the things side by side. On one side, there is esophagus and other side, there is a conduit, the colon, which we have taken up in the neck. And then we are doing the anastomosis with sutures. So this was a hand even anastomosis we did in the neck. That is the esophagus. We have opened up the Hegar's dilator. You can see there the metallic thing, which has come up. A side to side esophago colic anastomosis was done. So this colon, when it comes down into the stomach, it is anastomosed to the stomach, the cologastric anastomosis. And lastly, uh, ileum is attached to the colon. So that is the end of surgery. We end the surgery by doing a feeding jejunostomy or retaining the feeding jejunostomy, which was there. So on sixth day, we did a contrast study for this patient and it showed a very well passage of the contrast across our anastomosis. There was no leakage. And as you see, the contrast is filling up the colon there. And on uh, four month follow up, uh, we did this surgery in April. He came up, uh, came back to us in July. This is how the colonic conduit was working very well for the patient and patient had around seven kgs weight loss, uh, uh, weight gain, sorry. And he was not uh, taking any feeding jejunostomy. He was eating everything with the oral intake. So corrosive injury esophagus, when a surgeon comes in, surgeon comes in picture when there are complex or non-dilatable strictures which are basically long strictures, more than five centimeter or sometimes uh, uh, 10 centimeter nowadays with advanced or more aggressive endoscopists, angulated strictures, multiple strictures. We had multiple here, a pharyngoesophageal stricture or a perforation during previous dilatation. These are basically complex or non-dilatable strictures which should be sent for surgery. A refractory stricture, which is in fact inability to achieve a 14 millimeter diameter with five successive dilatations at two weeks interval. We were getting a diameter of 14 millimeter every time when the patient came to us, but then patient again had cicatrization and used to come with a pinhole. So this patient was actually a recurrent stricture in which the patient was used to get stricture again after retaining 14 mm diameter. So why not stomach? Uh, why we used colon or why we prefer colon is uh, these are the reasons on the right side, which I'm telling you the reservoir function of stomach is well, very well preserved. Now, if you're doing something for a malignancy where patient is old age, the life expectancy is hardly two or three years. That time it's okay to take a gastric conduit or gastric tube in the chest. But for a 21, 22 year old boy who is going to live his whole life, keeping reservoir function of stomach is very much important. Whatever the function of stomach are has to be given. Colon has got a better functional outcome. Colon has got a better vascularity as compared to stomach tube, which we take. We can attain more length in colon as compared to the stomach. 
colon is resistant to acid injury so if you take uh, uh, stomach up it will cause more reflux in the esophagus whatever the remnant esophagus is but the only problem with colon is of course it's a complex surgery and it needs three anastomoses one in neck one in colon to stomach and third one is to small bowel to the colon and that's why it's technically more difficult the leak rate in colonic conduit are only 7 to 10% as compared to around 15% leak rate in stomach that is the reason why we prefer colon as a conduit then again it could be a right sided or a left sided colon for surgeons this is important uh, uh, the right sided has a advantage because the we take ileum up in the neck it matches the lumen of uh, 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 esophagus and ic valve technically can prevent the reflux in case if there is a necrosis at the tip we can any time use the transverse colon and go on to the left colon but if the left colon is used the whole colon goes away you have to do a ileosigmoid then you don't have any conduit to take up in the neck why we don't remove the esophagus because as i said it's a very messy affair there uh, but with advent of thoracoscopy if the patient has no history of perforation in the past and all even a thoracoscopic esophagectomy can be done in these patients and the conduit can be placed in the posterior mediastinum root we keep it in the retrosternal area we don't remove the esophagus because the morbidity is more with that surgery and just last uh, slide so when esophagus dilatation is not possible or fails to provide an adequate esophageal caliber in long term esophageal replacement by retrosternal stomach or preferably colon interposition should be considered we should wait at least 6 months before venturing into surgery because that is the remodeling time that is time to stricture stabilization up to 6 months is required that is the algorithm which we uh, follow and that's what we did in this patient a weekly or biweekly dilatation were done and as it failed we went ahead with surgery for this patient so corrosive stricture uh, of stomach and esophagus need a full care evaluation with upper gi endoscopy and barium endoscopic dilatation if it is possible it should be the first and should be the treatment of choice because the surgery is of course very major a non dilatable or refractory strictures always need surgical treatment colon pull up or gastric tube based on anatomy expertise is the treatment of choice for conduit uh, uh, esophageal replacement now whether we can use colon or stomach whether we should resect the esophagus or not resect we should use right or left colon these are all topics uh, of debate but there is no conclusive evidence because we don't have much studies or much published literature on this and it all depends on expertise which is available and the philosophy in which the team believes thank you excellent case uh, yogesh uh, nicely managed do you have a cartoon which can tell us the final three anastomoses uh, final what three three anastomoses which you have done yeah so i'll just show you quickly there so this is the neck anastomosis which is going on you can see this hegaz no, dilator it's, it's not there here. sorry yeah so that is the metallic hegaz dilator which is coming up through the mouth it is coming into the esophagus so that is esophagus to the colon anastomosis which is being done here i'll show it better here no cartoon which can show us esophagus better. to colon or ileum in this case actually ileum got bit dusky so we had to use uh, colon uh, cecum or ascending colon sorry sir uh, cartoon which can show uh, diagram line diagram diagram i don't have that here sorry <laughs> so the distal end of colon comes into the stomach so that is the cologastric anastomosis i'll show here this is the colon and the stomach which are getting anastomosed with the stapler here so the proximal colon goes to neck yeah. so the ascending colon goes in the neck or the ileum goes in the neck the transverse colon comes in the abdomen and it gets anastomosed to the stomach and the remnant transverse colon is anastomosed to the ileum which is remaining there these are the three anastomoses yes. so that is just a theoretical advantage we don't know exactly uh, the people who use right colon or ileo colon they say that it prevents reflux what do you mean the the ileum part that it go lower in the stomach no 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 sir it's just a theoretical it's 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 opposite way the colon is basically down so it should not uh, prevent reflux but that is a theoretical thing which is being written everywhere that uh, by using ileo colon the advantages are ileum has a lumen exactly like an esophagus so anastomosis what i want to ask is whether the ileum part of the colon there yeah. are two parts yeah whether the ileum part of the colon is anastomosed on the stomach side 
No, no, no. It's the colon which is anastomosed on the stomach side. Ileum is anastomosed to the esophagus. Yeah, yeah. So you are using part of ileum and colon both. Yeah. So we try to use ileum to anastomose in the neck. If you see this barium, you will see that uh, very properly. See, this Why is. Sir, how can we use opposite? How can we take colon up and keep the ileum down? It would be inverted. The 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 vessel vessel middle colic will have a torsion there. Middle colic will get blocked. There will be torsion. Middle colic will get blocked. So here you can see. Uh, can you show the screen? The screen. You can see the ileum was anastomosed in the neck. So that is the ileum you are seeing. And below you can see the bulge of cecum, which has come up in that barium. Uh, So it was esophago. This was esophago uh, ileal anastomosis. Five centimeter is enough. Three to five centimeter. Sir, it was twenty centimeter. The esophagus thickener was twenty centimeter. If you see the barium here, we had a very good length of esophagus in the neck. So we had a good pouch of the esophagus which was dilated in the neck. So we could get. Then it we do the anastomosis on pharynx or pyriform fossa. But the patients do have troubles in swallowing. Uh, sometimes they may land up with tracheostomy also if the anastomosis is just on the piriform fossa. We have to teach them the swallowing by looking towards left and compressing the neck so that everything goes in the left piriform fossa. Sems, sems. There is sir. There is no comparative study between surgery, endoscopy, dilatation. There is no comparative study. Whichever fails on endoscopy side comes to surgery. That is the study only we have. No, no idea about stents. No, we don't open it. We don't do anything. It's just there, intact as it is. See, it's a conduit. See, we we don't want to use ileum or colon for its peristalsis. It's just a conduit. Food is going to go down with gravity. Everything goes down with the gravity. Simple. It's an extremely frustrating problem. Uh, we always ask our patients that we should be prepared with fully covered stains. Those who are young, those who have tight strictures, um, they should be when they come for dilatation. One, they should be prepared for putting the fully covered stains for perforation. Are common in these patients. They are the most frustrating patients to see. I have seen patients, those who are operated also, and had anastomotic strictures post surgery. Yeah. So, I mean, surgery is also not the green field zone or the, the option of choice. I think it should be the last resort. The so basically, of course, I surgery is the last resort. It has got mortality of around eight percent in the literature. Yeah. Even eight percent so mortality and the, yeah. The only thing I would say about surgery is uh, comparative to dilating that stricture as esophagus. Dilating an anastomotic stricture is a easier job. Yeah, that is true. That is true. But then surgery is also associated with. Uh, yes. 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 For sure. And I have seen one surgery where the esophagus, the colon, was uh, in the sub subcutaneous way. Yes. Above the uh, sternum. Yeah. So when the patient. Uh, was asked to swallow. He can press his hand. The, the food is not. He can dictate the food to go down. So that is the problem with submucous sub uh, submu that uh, subcutaneous. The food has to be pushed down with the hand every time. Yeah. I don't know. I think probably uh, earlier days that surgery was done where without infection they put the anastomosis here and here. And getting an endoscopy in such situation is difficult yeah. because there is an angle to it. Definitely. So this patient, I I still remember that this patient had some this uh, recurrent 
So my uh, my just question is in this case or any case what what threshold do, do you people use that now it's enough so we, we are seeing this picture which is every time he's coming up with a pin no if you give more cases to us we can give that assurance but then my my just looking at this this endoscopy sir <laughs> no sir no sir that's not an issue sir this patient when i was uh, making the videos of endoscopic dilatation i was a bit surprised ki, can these really work or can these really heal over a long period of time so we gave adequate seven to eight dilatation that is fine but somewhere while doing second or third dilatation do you get an idea this won't open up ever is there anything which you can predict Seventy-five year old, okay, sir. Seventy-five year old, okay. For a twenty-five year old, can we tell him fifty dilatations, seventy dilatations per year? My one experience with the corrosive stricture was when I was doing my MS. Uh, the our seniors, along with the microvascular surgeon, took a segment of ileum, brought it up, and did the microvascular analysis. So there is a concept of free jejunal flap for a small stricture in the neck yes. that you take a jejunal uh, uh, segment with the vessels and do a microvascular anastomosis in the neck. 
but it's only in very localized centers which was followed and there is no robust data on that how much it really works sure. and all but it did not i mean in this case it did not work that way yeah it, there were two strictures so we could not have thought of that no, i mean i'm talking about the even in that case it didn't work okay i think uh, we Salam. can uh, the continue the discussion so during today we called him up we called him up so if you request sir sir you are new and uh, you, you if you request sir sir might give more <laughs> because i have i am trying since long <laughs> not known sir not known sir not known. i think uh, prince i think it's uh, getting very late yeah. and the uh, rest of the discussion can continue during uh, dinner so i congratulate team midas for uh, such a wonderful meeting great cases nicely discussed um, and on behalf of uh, uh, my co chair persons uh, dr dande dr rajit agrawal and dr uh, wilkinson and of course uh, the online chairpersons we wish to thank uh, midas foundation for giving us this great opportunity to chair this uh, meeting and uh, with that i hand over the proceedings back to the organizers thank you so as we come to end of this 107th midas clinical meet i thank our chairpersons dr prashant bhandarkar sir raju wilkinson sir dr rachit agrawal and dr siddharth dhande for being the uh, chairpersons our online chairpersons i will thank them dr philip abraham sir and dr rahul lokhande again uh, thank you very much to my co colleagues uh, presenters dr akshay kulkarni mukewar sir saurab dr bhushan and dr unmit chandak sir for being here uh, i thank all the audience for being in such a large number you come uh, and show your love every time to us and uh, it's always a houseful uh, show thank you very much and i also thank abat people for uh, continuing their support with this i now invite you for dinner thank you